Hey everybody, uh, welcome to this conference and uh, today we're gonna have um, a deep dive onto FPGA on device ARM Cortex deep reinforcement learning with uh, deep Q learning algorithm and how we can implement that. Please uh, feel free to ask questions. Uh, please feel free to ask and just uh, we can talk about it. So before we begin and uh, jump onto the deep Q learning technique, so primarily there are different types of uh, machine learning that are available. Um, we have uh, supervised and unsupervised machine learning. We have reinforcement learning. And the reinforcement learning is completely different from the supervised and the unsupervised learning because the supervised and unsupervised learning basically works on the label data. It has uh, takes the inputs from a system function and then it produces the predictable outcomes y. And um, there are different types of algorithms available for supervised and unsupervised machine learning algorithms where we can apply a number of algorithms to um, uh, predict the outcomes of the targets. And uh, we can also uh, provide uh, different types of uh, uh, data sets. We can deal with that. Now coming to reinforcement learning, it's uh, completely a different uh, proposition and the way that uh, things are handled in reinforcement learning are uh, entirely different because it, it is not just uh, about uh, handling the data and producing the outcomes, but it is about the ability to uh, basically, uh, uh, for, for example, there is an environment and then there is an agent and the agent performs specific and each action, they basically receive a reward or are going to get a penalty based on that. So a number of fields have already potentially leveraged the reinforcement learning and a number of companies have been successful in dealing with uh, the reinforcement learning technique. And that's when exactly where we think uh, the future is because a lot of companies have applied, including uh, space exploration like Companies like NASA have uh, sent some uh, uh, Mars rovers and multiple uh, spacecrafts where, because the situation is completely unknown, and the sp spacecraft is about to land onto Mars or somewhere, uh, basically, you know, the environment is not known, like what's the gravity and, you know, how it's going to land and all other stuff gets more complicated because for supervised learning, you have all known parameters where you have the labeled data and you know the specific outcomes you're looking for and based on the data patterns it can produce. But uh, the thing about reinforcement, learning, it, it doesn't have to necessarily always deal with uh, some sort of, uh, uh, you know, the data labels where we can uh, primarily uh, uh, have that known environment to navigate within because UAVs and spacecrafts, they go through all, of, all sorts of uh, um, you know, different environments, and that's where you you, you have this uh, agent uh, interacting with the environment, and you have uh, uh, different types of environments. Again, we have discrete environment, we have continuous environment, and there's a lot of math uh, surrounding it. How do we compute this reward function in continuous versus uh, uh, discrete environment and continuous state space, and uh, how do we produce these uh, outcomes? So we will take a look at that as we go along. And um, so coming to a brief history of AI, so primarily uh, the AI has been there around. It, this is not a brand new concept, AI, that we are bringing into this uh, world, like something like, you know, we are seeing a lot of things are happening in the recent times, but AI has been there for a very long time and it, it has been there from 1950s. and. Uh, so primarily, we have been seeing a lot of shift uh, from the AI in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the way that we have been dealing with the things. And, uh, for example, in the 90s, we saw uh, different types of uh, algorithms that were discovered. In the 80s, we have seen knowledge-based systems. Basically, it just, the system is built through uh, millions of rules encoded, and the system basically performs based on different rules. So if there is, uh, you know, A, execute B, if there is C, execute D, so on and so forth. But they 
discovered as they went through uh, millions of permutations and combinations, uh, that wasn't very successful because you only have so many combinations that you can handle with your rules. And it's, it gets so complicated to program so many rules around the system. Um, so then they moved away from those techniques and moved into something more algorithmic. Uh, uh, and uh, that's when like even in 50s, Turing tried with uh, Turing neural machines with different type of uh, permutations and uh, combinations. And there was a lot of calculus that was applied with integrals to kind of uh, come up with uh, different type of approaches. But um, then again, as we move forward into 2000s, um, you know, the machine learning techniques that were invented like Bayesian neural networks and uh, Navis and a number of decision trees, uh, random forest, so all of these algorithms are only going through a fixed number of uh, neural networks. So machine learning. And as we move into 2000, we started seeing a lot of these uh, uh, neural networks uh, uh, shot to fame with uh, deep learning. Deep learning primarily is completely different from machine learning because the machine learning is based upon the human brain, the way the neurons operate. So the neuron takes an input and then it goes through multiple layers and then it's going to produce the output. Uh, coming to uh, deep learning, it just doesn't have to have a single hidden layer. You can have up to uh, three or four hidden layer in the uh, deep learning. Uh, it could get, I mean, you can even have 10,000 uh, hidden uh, neural networks for deep learning to function. So and that's when people uh, started uh, running a number of uh, uh, scientific fields uh, through neural networks. Like, for example, if you're talking about chemistry or physics, or, uh, uh, you know, you can also refer to some of the bioinformatics, genomics, all of the fields have revolutionized because there is now uh, more uh, ways of calculating it and coming up with so many outcomes. Like, you know, they also try to implement uh, supercomputing, uh, even like, uh, you know, before the deep uh, deep learning, before the 2000s, people used to uh, bombard the islands and, you know, uh, shoot through the uh, islands, creating holes with all the nuclear weapons. They moved away from all of that approach because they can simply simulate the bomb with deep neural networks and run some statistics and maths and create the uh, uh, networks. That's how they revolutionized all types of fields. Um, and now uh, let's uh, take a look at uh, how reinforcement learning has been rising up in the recent times and uh, what are the techniques that have been applied uh, through the rise of the deep reinforcement learning. So the deep reinforcement learning, again, has been there uh, from the same time where AI has begun, but then they were uh, leveraging different type of machines to operate at a much uh, uh, different scale. It's, it was not really, uh, you know, uh, gone to that scale where it could run through neural networks. So that's when DeepMind sometime in 2015 has trained uh, the reinforcement law learning algorithm for the game AlphaGo. AlphaGo, again, is a game that has been for a while. And uh, when they're trying to implement with that, there are they created with the Monte Carlo uh, search algorithm. And through Monte Carlo search algorithm, they created a number of algorithms. And basically, it can simulate thousands of moves before um, you know the human can make a move. It can understand and uh, just traverse through those uh, uh, Monte Carlo tree search algorithms. and uh, pivot through it and come up with a specific probability of what the other person is going to make a move. So that's how uh, the machine calculates and this is, you cannot accomplish such kind of thing from supervised or unsupervised because it has only a specific way of uh, handling uh, things around. So that's when um, it has been a great success and they have actually shown that for all of the people when they even took it to European Go champion that it can actually work. And this is not just uh, an idea. We demonstrated that and they were able to uh, see that uh, uh, like you, the best human champions were defeated in the game. And, uh, you know, this is primarily the uh, architecture behind this uh, Alpha Go Zero. And so, uh, as uh, uh, primarily have different types of uh, data so there is some sort of uh, offline 
uh, training is not like, you know, there's no data at all. But supervised and unsupervised learning requires so much of data for it to process. But for reinforcement learning, it, not always that you would need data because you can uh, train the machine with some sort of uh, offline data set so that it can understand, for example, train it with chess. So chess is already known, like what kind of a game it is, how many moves are there and all that. Then it can compute those millions of combinations and probabilities come up with another um, you know, proposition. This is how it's going to work. But there are different techniques in reinforcement learning to do. Uh, for example, like you have policy neural networks and, and then there are policy gradient reinforcement learning. There are a number of uh, techniques for that uh, that can be leveraged uh, to implement that. We'll see more and go forward. Um, so again, uh, how do we know that reinforcement learning has uh, a promising landscape in the future, and what are the uh, you know arts that reinforcement learning is the future? So for this reason, MIT Technology Review has basically downloaded 16,625 research papers from Ericsson, where it was uh, trying to understand, and these are all on the machine learning topic, nothing specifically to do with reinforcement learning, and trying to understand with different types of words there, like constraint theory, rule, logic, program. And uh, basically what they came to know that uh, reinforcement learning has been gaining the route. And uh, they're able to uh, primarily, um, you know, uh, get this, uh, uh, you know, the, the trending topic on the research papers is reinforcement learning. That means a lot of uh, researchers already have moved to, um, you know, the reinforcement learning. And a lot of companies also have moved to reinforcement learning like eBay, uh, PayPal, a lot of uh, silicon companies already working and operating on the uh, uh, production environments of reinforcement learning for uh, calculating um, uh, you know, their uh, business transactions and the volume of trade and uh, so much of stuff. So again, deep traffic is another uh, uh, MIT project where they predict the traffic, how it's gonna work. So always there is an optimi optimized way of uh, uh, you know, handling the traffic because on a multi-line freeway, we always see most of the traffic is uh, stuck and nothing is moving, but that's not the case because there's, there's still a lot of space for the vehicles to move around. So that's what, uh, how do we optimize this traffic? So that's what this uh, deep traffic. So primarily it is implemented on a deep queue neural network. And uh, uh, so basically it has shown that we can actually achieve that. And they created this in the Mujaco environment where actually uh, people can uh, uh, optimize our traffic. And uh, um, so again, um, as we discussed about uh, policy gradients, so uh, basically for uh, an agent to implement a reinforcement learning uh, in a particular environment, every environment will require a policy. So it's it's like creating a strategy to operate in that environment. And there are different types of strategies. Again, we're talking about like TRPO, we're talking about PPO. So trust region policy optimization. And uh, there's also a policy gradient optimization. And these are the algorithms that we can implement. There are also different uh, combinations like synchronous, asynchronous. Synchronous is something that executes only when the first process completes, the second process goes in, and then it runs through uh, uh, mostly cube technique. But if you're going for asynchronous, asynchronous can uh, perform it parallelly and concurrently. And uh, so basically uh, it produces the uh, uh, returns, which are nothing but the rewards. And we're basically gonna discount it and then um, apply these uh, cumulative rewards for each trial and that gives us a function approximation so that we can actually maximize the return for each computation so that uh, the, the success probability goes very high and th this can pretty much be applied to any industry it's not limited to any industry it can apply to any type of industry and um, again so this is a, a little bit of breakdown and uh, coming to uh, FPGA, so basically uh, um, this was applied, the deep reinforcement learning on uh, FPGA um, on device ARM Cortex. ARM Cortex is basically a processor, which is a lightweight processor that works on mobile processors. And uh, so they want to run this uh, particular uh, uh, deep reinforcement learning on ARM Cortex processor, which is basically an FPGA. FPGA is a field program gateway arrays. 
and uh, which is different from ASIC chips. There are also different types of accelerated uh, um, uh, chips, and FPGA is basically a different type of chip. Basically, this is to boost the uh, throughput of training and uh, producing the outcomes. So there is a card pool environment that was created on the ARM Cortex processor and uh, it was implemented. I can actually run the whole demo with the code which I have programmed for uh, my upcoming book. But uh, based on the timing, we can see if you can actually run the demo here or not. My Jupyter book is already been running here. But, uh, uh, you know, it all depends on that. And uh, uh, so, so basically, this is how uh, we can do that. And uh, again, uh, coming to uh, the companies we talked about. So uh, we have uh, this algorithm implemented in several fields. As I mentioned, it has been implemented by Intel for healthcare, and it has also been implemented for manufacturing, industrial IoT, robotics, text mining, um, you know, all different types of uh, deep fuel learning, on policy, off policy, a number of uh, reinforcement learning algorithms uh, have been implemented again. How many algorithms can we implement? So this is primarily the breakdown of uh, uh, reinforcement learning. So basically you have policy-based uh, uh, reinforcement learning algorithms, you have queue learning algorithms, which is mostly like uh, um, you know the machine learning reinforcement learning. If you're going for deep reinforcement learning, which is deep neural network, then you can do DQN and you can also do QR uh, quantile regression DQN. And there's also um, you know world models and uh, uh, hierarchical, um, you know, uh, type of uh, uh, reinforcement learning. And again, you can find that more information in my upcoming book on how to implement each of them and corresponding algorithm and uh, what industries have benefited from this. So I think considering that I'm, I'll just open up uh, uh, for discussion. If you have any questions, please uh, feel free to ask me for any of questions you may have. Hello, uh, can all hear me? Hello, are you able to hear me? Hello. Okay, if there are no further questions, thank you very much. Feel free to send me email or uh, uh, send uh, some message so that I can respond to you if you have any questions on any of these topics that we can go through. Thank you very much. Yeah, so basically, okay, thanks for the question. So policy gradient estimation, we can, so the backprop is basically a calculus algorithm, the backprop is uh, can be applied for gradient or can be applied for any uh, calculations that we can uh, perform on uh, different types of uh, I mean we can apply for uh, Boltzmann machines we can apply for recurrent neural networks we can apply for uh, convolutional neural networks pretty much the backdrop can be applied for anything and it's nothing specific with reinforcement learning the same uh, uh, backdrop we can take here and also if you're talking about uh, uh, the forward uh, 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 prop also you can apply. And uh, so this is the FPGA implementation of, uh, um, and this is the ARM Cortex uh, um, uh, architecture on how to implement it. Um, but again, uh, uh, the back, back prop can be applied pretty much for any of the, um, you know, uh, policy gradient. We can apply for all of these algorithms. You can take uh, backdrop and apply to pretty much each of these algorithms uh, like A to C, uh, A3C, PPO, TRPO, take any of the algorithms and you can apply the backdrop. It, it's not just restricted to policy gradient, but definitely we can apply for policy gradients, but it is not limited uh, for that. Any other questions, please?
Yeah, definitely in my upcoming book, I'm going to cover the entire introductory material on reinforcement learning and the uh, linear algebra, the mathematics behind it, and calculus behind it, and how to apply it. And then again, I will uh, uh, go to advanced topics where we can apply each of these algorithms for different environment. And I'm covering that in the upcoming book. Uh, certainly, that will be there. It all depends. I mean, there, like as I said, like we can have, uh, you know, just like the uh, gates, just like the neural networks in uh, breaker neural networks or continuation neural networks. Anything if you have more than three, that's going to be uh, like a, a deep neural networks. Anything that's less than three or even one is basically like you know. Um, uh, what we have as uh, machine learning. As we increment the more neural networks, we get more deep neural networks. So again, the gates are similar. So the gates all depends on how much we want to scale. It's all the large scale data we are processing through to know how much we need the data. So based on that, we can implement the number of gates for it.